Hi, and welcome to our final episode of our Advent Reflection Series, God With Us, where we've been taking a chapter-by-chapter -chapter look with St. Athanasius on his great work on the Incarnation as a way of helping ourselves to prepare to celebrate with greater understanding and greater joy the Incarnation of Christ this Christmas season. My name is Deacon Matt Newsom. I'm the Catholic Campus Minister at Western Carolina University. And as this episode is going live on Christmas Eve. Let me wish you a Merry Christmas. We have reached the end of our Advent journey. So let's look back on, on where we've been. Um, we, we began this series with St. Athanasius by looking at the Incarnation in relationship to creation, to God's act of creation and what that means. And of course, part of going back to the beginning means also looking at the fall of man. We identified man as that part of creation that God made in his own image. But when man fell from grace, we fell from God's friendship by turning our, our gaze away from him as a source of our life and looking inward at ourselves and following our own selfish desires. Um, that created a problem for us, right? This is why death entered the world after the fall, because we've removed ourselves from the source of our life, who is God. And so, St. Athanasius looks at some of the reasons why God would become man. God would enter into his own creation, take on human nature, and become one of us. This is what we mean by the incarnation. And he did this principally to save us from our sin and the consequences of sin, which is death. He came to restore us to life. And in order to do that, he not only had to become one of us, but he also had to die as one of us. And this is one of the reasons why St. Athanasius in this book on the Incarnation, spend so much time talking about the passion and the death and the resurrection of Christ, because that can't be properly understood without reference to the Incarnation. It's all part of the same story. As I mentioned um, uh, before, the best way to keep Christ in Christmas, to keep Christ central as our focus of our Christmas celebration, it's to keep Christmas within Christ. It's to understand what we celebrate at Christmas within the context of the entire Christian story, the entire life of Christ. And St. Athanasius does look at the entire life of Christ. He points out that another reason for the Incarnation was so that God might reveal himself to us, to make himself known more fully to us. And so he didn't simply become incarnate as a man and then die for us, but he lived among us for a while. He taught us. So we have his teachings. We have the evidence of his life and his miracles, all of these things that Jesus did to reveal who God is to us in a more personal, more intimate way. And so, God not only restores us to life, um, but he also gives us the grace that we need to fulfill the purpose of our life, which is to know him and to love him as the source of our life. So, he goes into all of this detail and laying out what the, resurrect, the uh, incarnation is and what it achieved for us. And then in the latter part of the book, He's been dealing with those who disbelieve in the Incarnation and refuting that disbelief. And he does so by beginning with the Jewish people who are in a unique place um, because they have received God's revelation. They have the scriptures. They had this anticipated hope of a Messiah. And so he argues with them by pointing out how Jesus is the Messiah that they've longed for. And he does this by, by referencing their own Jewish scriptures, principally the prophet Isaiah. And then beginning in the last chapter, he starts to refute the non-belief of the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people. Last chapter, he did this by appealing to reason, by showing that our, our faith in the incarnation of God is not irrational, it's not ridiculous, that it makes sense, and it is indeed fitting that God would do this for us. And then in this chapter, he continues his refutation of the Gentiles by arguing not from reason, but from history from the history of the world around us by showing that since the coming of Christ, since the coming of God into the world, things are different. He points out several things that, that have changed. Um, and so before we look too much into his argument from history though, a little reminder of where St. Athanasius is in history. If you go back to the very first episode of this series, we, we talked about the history of St. Athanasius and who he was and why he was writing, just to give us an important historical context. So let's just remember that right now. He's writing during the fourth century. 
So what was going on in the church at this point? What had happened? Well, the church was still very young. And for most of its history, the church had been illegal and the church had been persecuted, sometimes quite harshly, quite violently. This was the era of the martyrs. And despite that very harsh persecution, everything the Roman Empire could throw at her, the church continued to grow and grow rapidly for the first 300 years. Now, in the fourth century, St. Athanasius um, belongs here to the first generation of Christians that for whom the church has been legal. Christianity has been legal, has had the support of the Roman Empire, and so as rapidly as the church was growing during the age of persecution, it was now growing even more rapidly and even more widely that it could um, operate out in the world, in society, with a lot more freedom. And so this is where St. Athanasius was. And so here are some of the things that he points out that have happened since the coming of Christ. Number one, he says people have abandoned the worship of idols. He says every, every village, every culture, every people, every tribe, they all had their own false idols that they worshipped. And since the coming of Christ, he says, that has stopped. And they're all worshipping Jesus now. And in this fact, he doesn't go put too fine of a point on this, but this is what struck me as I was reading it. In this fact, Jesus has really demonstrated himself to be a universal God. Universal meaning Catholic. That's what the word Catholic means. He is a Catholic God. The, the Christianity is a Catholic religion. The church is a Catholic church. It's truly universal. We, we forget this aspect of ancient paganism sometimes, but all of the gods that the ancient pagans worshipped, they were all local. They were local gods. Right? You had you had Jupiter and Mars and, and Juno, you know, in Rome. In in Greece you had Zeus and you had Poseidon and Hermes and you know in Egypt you had Isis and Horus and all of this. And sometimes it was every little village had their own little village god. Every tribe had their own god. And there was no expectation, there was no belief that any of these gods had universal jurisdiction. So if you were a Roman soldier, for example, you might worship Mars when you're in Rome, but if you travel to Egypt, you're, you're going to start worshiping Egyptian gods because the understanding is that the Egyptian gods have power in Egypt. And so if you want your prayers heard, if you want your requests granted, you would pray and give a sacrifice to the gods of Egypt, to the gods of where you happened to be. There was no evangelization that was taking place. Nobody cared if you believed in this god or that god. It didn't really seem to matter. Um, because none of the gods had a, uh, a universal claim on anyone's faith and, uh, and allegiance. But Jesus is different. Jesus is different. All of these, these false gods have proven to be powerless now. And in place of them all, they all worship Christ. People of every culture, of every race, of every nation are coming to worship Christ as the one God. Christ alone is worshipped everywhere. And that's unique. That's unique in history. It had never happened up until that point. The other thing St. Athanasius points out is all the oracles have stopped. He names all the famous oracles, and you've probably heard of the Oracle of Delphi, um, the, the Greek oracle uh, at Delphi. He names the Oracle at Delphi. He names a bunch that you've probably never heard of. I know I haven't heard of them, right? Um, uh, Boeotia, Lycia, Libya in Egypt. He, he names several, um, the, the, the Pythoness and so forth. He says they've all stopped. All these famous oracles, they've all ceased to prophesy. And he claims that these oracles were, were actually the work of demons that were trying to trick mankind. But since the coming of Christ, he says, they've all stopped. He says the fantasy has ceased since Christ has entered into the world. And the other thing that ceased, he says, is the power of magic. He says before Christ came, this power of magic was strong and active among the Egyptians and the Chaldeans and the Indians. And he says it filled everyone who saw it with awe and terror and astonishment. But by the coming of the truth and the manifestation of the word, he says, it has been entirely destroyed. Magic has ceased. So all of these things have stopped. The worship of false idols, the, the proclamation of the oracles, the, the tricks of the magicians and the sorcerers. And then he kind of turns his eye to Greek philosophers and he says, these Greek philosophers, he gives them a little bit of a compliment. He says, they're onto something, right? When they try to encourage people to live upright, moral lives. If you read the Greek philosophers, they had a lot to say about living a virtuous life. He says, but as much good, thing as they had, good things as they had to say, they fail to convince most people. Even in their own neighborhoods, most people haven't practiced the virtuous life that they've been preaching. But he says, by Christ, 
by Christ this has been done. It's a, this call to a virtuous life has been achieved by Christ among all of his followers with simple words. Simple words, not learned philosophy, but just simple words that have been able to convince people from all over the world to follow a life of virtue. And to all of this, he says, look, you don't have to take my word from it. Just look around. Look to your own experience, and you can see that this has been the case. If Jesus was just a mere man, a mere man who who founded his own religion, a mere man who started his own philosophy, a mere man to whom other people have attributed these things, if he was just a mere man, how could this one mere man be stronger than all of the gods, all of the idols, all of the magicians, the oracles, and the philosophers who have ever existed in the world who could never achieve everything that has been achieved since the Incarnation? Right? He says that the, the works of the Incarnation, if you tried to, to count up everything, all these achievements that have just flown out of that, that Incarnation, he says it's like trying to count the waves of the ocean. Right? You can't do it because they just keep coming. They keep coming. They keep rolling in. In all of these works, he says, these are not human works. These are intrinsically and by comparison to the works of man, superhuman and the works of God. Intrinsically and by comparison to the works of man, meaning in and of themselves, they manifest themselves as divine works. But also compared to the works that have been achieved by other people, you can see that there's something unique. There's something different about this. And even though you can't count all of the, the good works that have flowed from the Incarnation, he says there's one final sign of God's coming among us that, that, that he mentions, and that's peace. He mentions peace. I want to read to you from what he says here about the, the peace that has come into the world since the coming of Christ. He's talking about the way of life of, uh, of the pagan peoples before Christianity. And he says, while they were yet idolaters, the Greeks and barbarians were always at war with each other and were even cruel to their own kith and kin. Nobody could travel by land or sea at all unless he was armed with swords because their irreconcilable quarrels with each other. Indeed, the whole course of their life was carried on with weapons and the sword was with them. The sword with them replaced the staff and it was a mainstay of all aid. All this time, as I said before, they were serving idols and offering sacrifices to demons, and for all the superstitious awe that accompanied this idol worship, nothing could wean them from that warlike spirit. But strange to relate, since they came over to the school of Christ, as men moved with real compunction, they have laid aside their murderous cruelty and are war-minded no more. On the contrary, all is peace among them and nothing remains save desire for friendship. This is something that's important to, to note here, because we tend to romanticize many ancient cultures and we, in pagan religions. They were violent. They were violent. If you study the actual history of these people and places, it was a violent time. Most pagan religions practiced some form of human sacrifice. Most pagan societies were constantly at war with one another. There was very little regard for human life. It was the the um, it was survival of the fittest. It was might makes right. Um, when um, uh, when when we hear about an eye for an eye and a tooth for a uh, tooth in the Old Testament, that was a way to limit the vengeance and the violence that people would would um, would would seek out on each other. The world was a very violent place, and this changed, began to change with the coming of Christianity. One of the hallmarks of the early Christians was the love that they showed for one another. You know, in ancient Roman society, if someone had a child that they didn't like, if someone had a baby and that baby appeared to be weak, or if someone's wife gave birth to a girl and they wanted a boy, they would expose that that baby to the elements they would kill it by by letting it starve to death on a hillside letting wild animals come and and, and murder it and uh, and christians would see these abandoned babies and they would adopt them and they would take them in even in poverty um, they would give from their own resources um you know charitable aid not only to their own family and friends but even to strangers who were in need and this astonished the pagan observers you may have heard that hymn they'll know we are christians by our love and the the refrain for that hymn actually comes from observations of pagan historians commenting on 
the behavior, the really weird behavior of these Christians. It's like, look at how they love each other. Look at how they care for each other. They recognize there is something there. And that's what attracted people to the church, even while it was being persecuted, is the love and the peace and the charity that flowed out of these early Christian communities as something altogether different from what the world had seen before. Now, St. Athanasius is not blind, right? He, there was still violence in the world in the 4th century, and he knew that. There were still idol worship and pagan religions in the world in the 4th century, right? As there are now. But, he says, these things have all diminished. They have all markedly diminished. The, the flow of history has changed. He remarks that since the, the Savior's advent in our midst, right? Advent means coming. Since the Savior's advent in our midst, not only does idolatry no longer increase, but it's getting less and gradually ceasing to be. Similarly, not only does the wisdom of the Greeks no longer make any progress, but that which used to be is disappearing. And demons, so far from continuing to impose on people by their deceits and their oracle givings and sorceries, are routed by the sign of the cross if they so much as try. But on the other hand, while idolatry and everything else that opposes the faith of Christ is daily dwindling and weakening and failing, see the Savior's teaching is increasing everywhere. Worship then the Savior. So what do we do? What do we do now that we've, um, we've come to know God in the incarnation, in Christ, in Emmanuel? What do we do? Well, St. Athanasius ends his study here by saying, this, this is just the beginning. You have to go on now and prove its truth by the study of the Scripture. Because it's there in the Scripture that you'll get to know this incarnate God that we've been talking about. In the Scripture, you'll learn not only of Christ's advent into history, right, the first coming of God into history, but you'll read about his second advent, his second coming, when he will come not in lowliness, but in his proper glory, no longer in humiliation, but in majesty, no longer suffering on the cross, but bestowing upon us all the fruit of the cross, the resurrection and incorruptibility, that eternal life which we're promised. And to understand all of this in Scripture, he says, you need to have a good life and you need to have a pure soul, because you cannot understand the teachings of the saints unless you are trying to imitate their life. This is the need for Christian discipleship, for right living, for the study of Scripture, for the striving to live a virtuous life, for participation in the sacramental life of the church where we can continue to know Him as Emmanuel, as God with us here and now in our lives in the sacraments, and for the need for that prayer life, that rich prayer life, which is that intimate relationship that we have with God in our own hearts and in our own minds. If you do this, if you live this life of Christian discipleship, you will know God as Emmanuel, God with us in Christ, not just now during the Christmas season, but throughout your life, right? and hopefully in eternity with him forever. Right? This is our hope. This is the hope of the Christian, and it's a sure hope. So I hope that this series, this Advent Reflection series, uh, has helped you to do just that, to come to know and love your Savior a little bit more so that you can celebrate with greater joy His coming in history during this Christmas season and celebrate with an infinite amount of joy His coming into your life. Merry Christmas, and praise be Jesus Christ.